Hey everybody, welcome to the long and boring tutorial number three, back by popular demand here. I was just goofing around and going back to some old footage here. This is uh, Evan walking through uh, Turkey Run, which if you're in Indiana, uh, southwest Indiana, or mid midwest Indiana, middle to the west of it, uh, it's a great place to visit. And this is a really cool area in the actual uh, path that's called the Punch Bowl, or just before the Punch Bowl. And we got some beautiful footage using the Blackmagic camera and 8K camera. So what I wanted to do was just go over um, creating a mesh from a camera solve. So what I went ahead and did, these are just com <coughs> some just kind of advisable things here. I took out the uh, actual noise uh, from the scene just for the purposes of maybe a cleaner track uh, So I have like the degrade degrain uh, Path here and I did some grading to kind of brighten up the uh, areas here So you can see it's a little bit dark so gaining it up would uh, allow for a little bit more You know visibility for tracking because I found that the first time I did a practice run on this that these areas were not really tracking too well so Anyway, and then I did a combination of the Pixel Fudger band pass with just the regular footage and sort of a mix. And I found that this actually gave me a pretty decent result. Um, I'm curious what everybody is using in regards to filtering for tracking. Um, if you guys have a better way of working, if you find that somebody was saying band pass is, uh, you know, sometimes it's work, sometimes it doesn't, you know. If there's a better filter or just a more robust filter in certain circumstances, I like the band pass. I think it's awesome. You know, just let me know. So then I went ahead and also did just some masking for the scene here in the areas where there's moving water and, of course, Evan going through the shot because I don't want to have those kind of calculate into the track. And I plugged that into a camera tracker and uh, into the mask input. So we shot this with a uh, eight millimeter spherical lens uh, on a Blackmagic Pocket 4K sensor. And the general sensor size is 1896 by 10 for the regular 4096 by 2048. I did a little bit of math calculation, find out that the sensor size of what we're actually capturing is a new resolution option that you can re uh, actually capture the footage with, uh, which is a beautiful sort of widescreen 239. 4096 by 1720 and that takes in part of the sensor a little bit smaller here not 10 but 7.96 so just doing a little bit of math i was able to es estimate because it wasn't written down anywhere that the sensor size the area of the sensor size that's being used is this right here um and again this is all spherical lenses we didn't use any anamorphic even though we have an anamorphic uh you know size of the frame here uh, these are not anamorphic lenses. This is a spherical lens. Um, and so anyway, so we'll go into the camera tracker and just kind of go in a couple of things that I set up here. I set the mask input to mask alpha. So if you go to the uh, settings here, you can see I do preview features. You'll see Evan and some of the uh, areas here where there's, you know, water flowing have been sort of taken out. I've put it to 700 features. Uh, Feature separation, I put it to three. Um, you know, you could separate them out, but I wanted to get is I didn't want to have points that were you know told to, you know to not track or or not be accountable if they're really close to each other because I want to get as much detail of what the mesh is of this little canyon. So it's t by adding more feature separation you're going to get a separation at least it, I don't know it doesn't look like it though but anyway. Um, but I'll just put that somewhere around three. And then the minimum, uh, you know, length of each track saying, you know, it won't keep the track unless it keeps a minimum length of five frames. Um, to be quite honest, uh, this is a very smooth shot, so I don't think we're going to have an issue. But I do want to hold on to these uh, tracks that are at the very beginning of the shot because I found that when I did build the mesh, these areas in the foreground were not calculating or not being interpolated into the actual mesh creation, um, just because obviously there wasn't enough data. So it kind of kept it f with that. And that's pretty much it. That's just all the uh, options I have here. So we can go ahead and just look at the options here. It's a free camera, lens distortion, 
Uh, I'm not going to undistort the input via the camera tracker node. I'm going to export out undistort nodes. The lens distortion is unknown as of yet, but we do know the focal length is approximately 8 millimeters. And we, again, plugged in the uh, film back or sensor size right there. So now I'm going to go ahead and hit track. And now we're going to go ahead and sit back and relax. All right, so we have a pretty decent solve here. Again, you got these beautiful spaghetti lines everyone loves. So we're going to go ahead and do a solve. So I'll go ahead and solve on this. All right, so we have an error rate of 256, which is not too bad for a start. We'll go over here and do some refining and you can see our max track error is 921. So we're going to try to bring that down. And again, this is the, I, I always kind of look at this and go, okay, like, where am I losing a lot of detail? Where if I do this too much, I'm going to lose all of these tracks. And what's the compromise? And honestly, I could probably half this and probably go for a max error rate of 3.8. And then I'll say delete unsolved and delete rejected and then we'll do another refinement here just by hit refine solve here and our error rate now should be a little bit better and it's at 1.94 which is good enough for what we're dealing with usually you want to be one or below but again we're going to lose all of these juicy points that we're going to use for creating a mesh so let's go ahead and do that so we're going to create, actually before we create, we might want to set our pivot points and so forth here. So I think I'll grab these points right here and right click and say ground plane and set for selected. And then we can take a single point and make it the uh, origin. Let's see here. Let's grab one point, set origin, there we go. So now if we go ahead and take a look at this, we'll go ahead and just create the uh, scene itself and push that through. And we also want to create, because we don't have it distorted here, the undistortion node. So we're gonna add that in here. So let's go ahead and find the footage here. But that doesn't have any color correction or anything like that going on. And take a look at what we got here. All right. So I'll go ahead and just close down a couple of these here. And the distortion is there. It's not too bad. We're moving, we're kind of sucking in. Sometimes it kind of folds out, but it's what it's established. And then from there, we can go ahead and take a look at our scene. Let's go ahead and just take a look at it. And you can start to see sort of a visualization of the actual ground. Looks like it's orientated correctly. And we've got a good, decent move here. And I'm not going to double check the tracking. You guys can do that on your own. We'll do that as we kind of move towards the mesh. So we're going to start with the point cloud generator. And there we go. And I found there's not a lot of, a lot of people kind of rush through this node. It's actually a really, there's in interesting features in here that you got to think of. So I'm going to put the source to lens distortion. Uh, the mask, we will want to also include the mask that is over here. So this is the mask I was showed before where, let me go ahead and take a look at the footage here. This is the mask that I masked out, Evan and so forth, because we don't want to include him because this is going to add more points. It's going to be adding more points than what the tracker had, so it'll be a combination of the two. So we'll add that in there, and we'll make sure, just like before, that we're using mask alpha. And then we have the camera, which is right here, and we'll just plug that in. So I kind of keep trying to keep this nice and tidy if I can, nice and pretty. So. In a way, there's like three different ways to set up what considers to be the interpolation of the triangulation via keyframes. 
a more dense uh, laying down of keyframes will be a more kind of scrutiny as far as the, the, again, the triangulation between the points. So there's a couple ways you can do this. You could actually add a keyframe uh, on different frames that you think are more important. Usually if there's a lot of motion, you want to have uh, definitely a keyframe every frame. So for instance, in here, I can make, I could add a keyframe. I come over here and I can add a keyframe. You can see this little dot right there. This is before we've done any of the tracking points. And then I maybe there's a fast whipping motion or the camera really speeds up right here. So I want to definitely make sure that it's interpolating like every single frame. But if the camera comes to a stop, then you can actually just add a keyframe here and then just let it go. So I want to kind of demonstrate that by just showing you the other options you can do on here, such as the automatic. So <coughs> I'll go ahead and delete these uh, keyframes here. If I can. Doesn't look like it wants me to. That is strange. I'll just hit delete all. There we go. So you can also do in every other frame. So if you feel that, you know, it's this is a consistent movement, you can just make it so that every other frame gets added. So you can do add all. And you'll get a keyframe every other frame, which actually is decent and, and usually will do the job. So I'm going to say uh, delete all again. And the other thing you do is you can have the computer figure this out. And this will actually speed things up. Uh, as far as the calculation, and that is the analyze sequence. So this is sort of like the third option. So if we go ahead and hit this, it's going to find out on its own where the keyframe should be. And it's going to probably figure it out by the motion. At the beginning of this shot, the camera's moving down the actual canyon, and then it kind of stops and pauses as Evan is aware of something coming around the corner. And then Evan takes off, camera left, and the camera stays sort of like in a quiet, unmoving position. So you're going to find as the keyframes the computer's going to figure out based on the movement in the shot, it's going to just make keyframes for uh, the beginning of the shot, and then it's going to come to the come to the kind of pause moment, and then say, okay, you know what, forget it. We don't need to each keep adding keyframes. And you can see that's exactly what it did here. It's doing every single frame because of the fast motion. But as soon as things start to slow down a little bit, it starts separating the spacing. And then finally, there is no keyframes at the end of this sequence, which is great. Um, but for me, I want to make sure that keyframe spacing, I'm also going to add two frames extra as we kind of move across here. So I'll just say add all. And now we've, we've added even more keyframes in the midst of this craziness. So with that said, we can go ahead now and start to track the points. So we'll go ahead and do this. Again, this will add points on top of the points that we've already tracked from our camera tracker. Go ahead and hit that. Hit OK. And this is going to take some time, so we'll get a coffee. So as you can see, I'm sitting at 22 minutes, and I'm going to definitely chill out for a while, watch some YouTube while I hit pause. All right, so this is what we got, and you can see that it is pretty dense. And by the way, by default, the viewer is set to Hydra. If you hit S for settings with your cursor in the 3D viewport, you can set this from Hydra, which, uh, or you can set it to Nuke. I prefer to Nuke the old-fashioned style. So you can see all of these insane points. And if we go to our cloud generator, <coughs> you'll notice that there are points that are red, and there are points that are just the regular color. So. Um, you can see right here we have display rejected points. So there's a threshold of angle and density. So density is important because we may not, we want points, we don't want to like interpolate a uh, actual 3D mesh solve from points by points that are way out in the middle of nowhere. So making sure that the density threshold, uh, the further out they are, the more they're going to basically be omitted or we're going to eventually delete them. But if you can turn this off, this helps by turning display rejected points on. And you can see how as points get further, as the points are further away from each other, they're going to be omitted. So if they're, they, you know, if, if the points are accurate, they should be very close to each other, but because they're so far away from each other, we're going to be deleting these. So I like to turn this thing off so I don't see the red points. But I see my mesh, so I don't want to go too far as far as deleting even details way back here. And then the angle threshold, uh, this people have said, 
you know, it, it has to do with like the angular interpolation of things. So you can see we have almost like it's getting kind of crazy here. Like we we got a mesh back here and we have a mesh here, and then the angle at which these would actually interpolate if it figures it out. So again, we can kind of come in here and take this and. As we increase this, we'll start to get away from these sort of uh, possibly even floating patches that shouldn't be there. But again, it's 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 got you got to be careful as far as like what you're going to possibly delete. And point size is good because if you start to bring this up, you start to see a visual interpolation of the environment, and you can see we have like this this strange little pocket here. And if we take our angle threshold will start to sort of like chew away at that sort of floating piece. See that? So it's 50-50 on what you want to do. Like you start bringing the points down to nothing, you get you get like nothing. So so anyway, I'm going to take the uh, point threshold and oops, I keep doing the wrong thing there. Uh, angle threshold and I'm going to bring it up to maybe just a little, like right about there, like one or maybe just a little bit above one. And now I can turn this back on and say delete rejected points. That's going to delete all those red points. Now we have something that we can work with, as you can see, and we could start to build an actual uh, uh, setup. There's also this really cool option here called out point points per frame. So if I click on that, this is kind of cool. As the camera comes through, you can see the points that it's interpolating. So early on, the, in, the sort of the triangulation of the, the points are these points here. And as we kind of move on, they get occluded by Evan as he kind of walks by. That's why you can kind of see a shadow here. But as we get further down the line, like frames like 87 and so forth, we start to see that that this wall here sort of disappears. See that? So this could also kind of tell us not to put a keyframe on every frame over here. So that's another option we can do depending on our mesh. So we might have a little bit too much interpolation of information going on here. And we'll see how that goes. So you can go ahead and like turn that off. Now we're going to group things. This is the tricky part because we want to be able to grab uh, stuff that we know is like basically we want to turn to a mesh. We don't want to have this little piece floating in the air here to be um, interpolated. So what you're going to do is you're going to come over here, put this to vertices selection, and you're going to grab vertices. I'll probably grab like that much. I don't want to go any further than that. And we're going to create a group. <laughs> you can obviously color code these to whatever color you want. So if you want to give it a different color code, hit OK. Now it's going to have a color code to it. And you're going to also go ahead and choose the samples before you do the bake. So you can bake out like points or an actual mesh. Uh, I found that sweet spot for the sampling is to set to 15. If we don't set to 15, it actually won't interpolate this front area. It'll actually sample it'll, it'll like grab the center area very accurately but it won't get these areas that are way out in the middle of nowhere so I'm gonna go ahead and put that at 15 and then say bake selected group mesh all right so let's see what we got here's the baked group mesh and we're going to kind of take a look at it by itself here and there you go so what I like to do is make a scan line render and we'll go ahead and do that right now. And we're going to put the object in there. We're obviously going to render the cam. And we'll bring in the undistorted plate. And we'll take a look at what we got. Um, what I usually do is I'll merge this. I'll actually put the background uh, plug off. And then I'll just basically come in here and merge it over. So. If you take the baked mesh itself, you can set the render to wireframe. So what you get with the scanline render, go ahead and take a look at it, is this, like that. So I end up merging it on, and because it's so bright being the white color, I usually bring the mix down pretty low. 
So I can kind of start to judge things from a kind of a grayscale, see how well it's sticking to the mesh. I'll also play it back either a quarter, spe uh, quarter resolution or half resolution at the top right so that it goes quick quickly. All right, so you can see if we go ahead and just play through our scene here, we have uh, some interpolations that are a little bit uh, off. Uh, almost feels like a wire mesh sticking outside a foot away from the ground, specifically on the left-hand side here. You can see that it's sort of like a double amount of geo that's, you know, kind of like sitting on top. Of it. It's just kind of like just off of the surface, which... Again, I find that to be um, a double-edged sword on setting keyframes every frame when you do the initial keyframes uh, for the you know interpolation of the triangulation because it can cause more meshes or more points than you would need and then they're at different distances and because of that you end up getting something that is a big dense mesh. You could also take this mesh via a right geo node and bring it into a 3D package and alter it and also do a little bit of uh, decimation on the poly count so it's not so high. Uh, but it, overall, in general, you know, it's not too bad on the ground, actually. You could see that the ground's holding up pretty well. Um, we do have, like, a mesh that's sort of sticking straight up at the beginning of the shot, which is rather interesting. But you could take this along with the points and export this out to a 3D package and start working on it. Um, I figured I might as well sh just also show you if we kind of like take this mesh and compare it to going sort of a different route. So I'll go ahead and just take that off. So here, again, this mesh is pretty th pretty huge, as you can see here. Uh, and it's also a little bit more detailed in these areas, which is really great, but it can also work against you because those points are actually about a foot away from the surface, so they're not actually, you know, sort of sitting on that. So. I'm going to make another uh, point cloud generator, and I'll just copy and paste this one so we know the sort of the difference between the two. And again, I'll just plug in the source footage, the camera, and the mask so you can kind of see this. And what I'm going to do in this circumstance is go ahead and make another mesh out of this. So I'm going to do... I'm basically going to delete all of this. We're going to analyze the sequence again. So I'll go ahead and take all of this. I'll go ahead and get rid of my group here. Say goodbye to that. And we'll see, uh, basically we'll come in here and reanalyze everything. So I'm going to just do a add all for keyframing for every other frame. And first I'll say delete all. And let's try to delete all these and see if I can find out if I can these are tricky sometimes to delete, I'm not sure why. Um, so I'll just do a keyframe for every other frame like that. And we'll go ahead and just come in here and do an analyze sequence once again. And we're going to override the existing frames. It's going to go a lot quicker by the way. This is going to be insanely fast compared to what we did last time, which we had a keyframe for every single point. You're going to get a more generalized mesh and, but all honesty, you might get somewhat of a more accurate mesh, but you'll also just be limiting your mesh to a more of the center area. It, it won't really build out uh, the outskirts areas too well. So you could take these two meshes and combine them if you wanted. So you could export two meshes into a 3D package and sort of like merge them together with some fancy modeling tips if you wish. But you can see here, this is not taking 20 minutes as we sort of do this, it's like ba-boom, right? So let's go ahead and kind of take a look at what we got. Very similar to what we had before. And then once again, we can come in here with our point separation. And let's see here, as I'll say display, and turn that on. We can start playing around with this here. And we also can get the, that density threshold, start to get all those outliers and angle threshold I'm going to try to bring that down pretty heavily here I don't want to lose the connection right here it just seems like we got two different worlds here sort of colliding here so let's see if we can kind of put these here there we go 
And I didn't talk too much about uh, track threshold and point separation that comes into uh, into effect also. And we'll get into that a little bit, maybe another time, I don't know. But it, it does sort of help. In fact, let's go ahead and bring the track threshold up. That'll give us a higher accuracy. And the point separation, let's put that up to four. And we'll go ahead and say track points. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look what we got. Again, we we have very little uh, really to grab a hold of here. And what I'm thinking I'm going to do this time is see what happens if I grab this mesh over here, but try to avoid these guys right here. So again, I can come in here, and you can also, if you want, you can grab points like this. You can right-click on them, as I just did, and you can actually say delete selected so if you find that you're like I need to get rid of some of these you can go ahead and get get rid of them there we go and again you could grab everything and you can right click and say create a group that's going to create a group obviously over here and we'll again hit big selected group mesh and see what happens you got to experiment with this this isn't like a one size one setting fits all, so to speak. You just gotta mess around with these settings a little bit. Some of the documentation in Nuke is a little bit unclear. Like again, there comes a point where you could watch and try to learn from and experiment and read from whatever the supposed you know parameter is that you're tweaking, but unless you sit there and do a little bit of experimentation, you'll start to see what gives you the best results that you're looking for. And I implore anybody that's a big professional listening and watching to post in the comment section. We won't attack you if you correct this, you know, correct me. Um, just curious to see better, at, you know, ways of working. Again, just trying to help people out here. So now I can take this here and plug it in over here. Let's first off, let's see what we got. You can see it's a lot more, it's a smaller in scope, obviously, because I chose less points. Um, but in this case, we are not we don't have that wall built here. We do have this stupid little piece that seems to be sticking right there. I don't know what that's all about. Um, and again, we can delete that if we need to. So I'll just come over here. Again, you got to set your render to wireframe. And now we have a new mesh. So, and again, if you wish to see the difference, and go ahead and make a switch node. I was told that you're a hack if you were to use a switch node. It's like only hacks use switch node, so call me a hack if you want. My system is really bogging down for some reason. There we go. Anyway, alright, so we kind of switch between these. There's the more dense mess. You can see the sort of the difference there. Uh, as far as the detail, but we, you can tell we've even lost some information over here, but at the same time in the midst of it, this might not be sticking out like in the last the last example, so we'll see, Let's, we'll take a look, it's a lot it's a lot less dense of a mesh, so we're just gonna go ahead and just cache this through and just see what it looks like, and again you could choose a quarter resolution if you wish I prefer to go with ha half, uh, that kind of speeds things up with a little bit more clarity and I can already tell that things are sticking pretty well uh, over here now, whereas before they were about a foot off the ground in comparison to the where the mesh is to where the real ground was. Alright, seems like we got a worse solve here. This is not just sticking off the ground on the left, but it seems like the points are sort of merging and uh, sort of interpolating into so like a kind of like a C here that is kind of sitting off the ground. Now the ground itself is not bad. So if I were in the need of painting out this kind of garbage here, um, or even getting away with possibly painting out the sign there that's sort of not very interesting. It's kind of like this tacky, you know, sort of like park sign that says a uh, punch bowl. Um, again, you can use this mesh uh, for that purpose. All right, so what I did here was uh, I did a really quick uh, frame hold on frame 145, and I just did a paint out 
of these two pieces. This one, I might want to do a live clone for this via laying out UVs because there's water sort of circulating there. Um, and then I just created a roto for that area and pre-multiplied that out and that gets projected based off of a frame hold of the actual camera and what you get in that respect is kind of move to the uh, apply material which is uh, the mesh and I chose the first mesh we rendered because it was a little bit more accurate so what you get is a sort of like a stretched texture on this and then right here and then, you know, you have your camera that moves through via, you know, that's just a static camera and a static mesh there. And then I had to create a lens distortion node because we are in an undistorted reality. And in order to do that, you go to your camera tracker node and you just export a distortion node, not a undistorted, but a distortion node. And that re-distorts the footage. But so what's important, again, is your scanline render actually renders uh, a little bit of an overscan because if this comes to the frame comes to the edge of the frame so if we kind of see if we can get to an edge frame there that if we don't have the overscan it's gonna cut it off basically because we are going to be uh, distorting this um, honestly I don't think it really matters because it will be pulling it out so if you go to see the lens distortion node it pulls it out okay so I I don't think we're going to need any overscan, but if you find that the footage gets sucked in, you want to definitely add some more overscan, which will extend this out. And then lens distortion node, of course, like I said before, like distorts the footage. And then we just merge this over to the original, original plate, not the undistorted plate, but the original plate. So what you get is something like this. And you merge it, and then you get that stuff cleaned up. Uh, so we'll go ahead and just kind of play through the frame so you can see like right here go ahead and disable and re-enable this so you can see what exactly has been kind of painted out there and you can just kind of like frame through it and again this this little block of wood here would probably be best to be cloned with a live clone via um, some sort of like cloning operation or laying out UVs on this geometry down here and in the midst of it, just cloning it over, or even doing planar, which is, might be a little bit easier for you. Um, so there is the uh, sort of setup all together there. Last but not least, I went ahead and did a live clone based off of a UVs uh, kind of projected onto the mesh itself so that I could have running water uh, clone from, uh, obviously, from top to bottom because this is the frame kind of coming into the shot. Uh, projection I should say and you don't want to clone from top to uh, from bottom to top because you'll be cloning black so I'm basically cloning top to bottom bottom left of the actual stream of the water over where that weird little uh, brick is so I'm going to show you how I did this um, so here's the project 3d still the live clone was I just took the mesh and I gave it a uh, I gave it a basic checkerboard pattern so you can't see it here just yet, um, but I just did a UV cam projection. So I just took a, I made a new camera and just projected it right above that piece and just did some uh, scaling and so forth. I probably could have scaled these uh, a little bit better. So you can go ahead and take the UV, U scale and V scale and kind of play with it to get perfect squares. Here I have rectangles, which is not a good idea. And you can see how it kind of extends out like a plus sign. This is basically just a repeat but the UV layout is like right here um, then I just applied the material so you can see as I kind of like put this through that we're getting a projection on here and the perspective I don't know if it's the perspective alignment of the actual geo that it's a shifting a little bit I think it's just the fact that the camera's kind of like moving over it um, but we can now take this live and clone over this actual waterfall over onto the rock so you kind of take like right here. So I took the camera, projected it, and then we take the scanline render and we set it to UV. And what we get is what I showed you earlier, which is everything. Again, you can use smart vectors if you want for this, or if you want to use a very blurred, take this and blur it, maybe and do a planar on it, you know, or something where you want to like have the clone brush uh, be perfect but then I just went ahead and did a quick uh, clone brush operation so now we have like again like a live 
clone of the rain, uh, sort of uh, water that's here that you can put over here. And you can do this on anything. Like you can do this on the cave wall or the, uh, the canyon wall or whatever. And then I have a mask here with a roto. Um, don't use a copy node because if you do a copy node, you'll end up showing black if you pre-malt it. So we're sort of like cutting out this area, which is important because when we get to the end of the scene here, we want to make sure that this is alpha because this technically is, this is being cloned over, but this is technically the edge of the frame at, at its projection point. So, and then you apply the material, but you apply the material from the material after it's been projected. So this in the timeline is when it's actually received its UVs. So you want to reapply that with another apply material, this time with a real scanline render node that is not set to um, anything. And you, again, you want to make sure um, when it comes to your samples, you want to bring it to two, set your shutter speed, make sure this is at the center for motion blur. So, And then we added another lens distortion redistort node. So if you go ahead and kind of take a look at it from this perspective, from above, Go ahead and just kind of take a look at, just kind of play it through. And what you're getting is basically another thing that you capture via the, the, the regular camera. And we have like that clone there. So again, you can see if I disable the roto um, paint, we get back to that piece of, I don't know what it is, honestly. I think it's just a rock. Yeah, it's a rock. So you can see like I'm going to take that and cut it out basically. So if you ever want to do a live clone, that's kind of a way to do it. And then we just merge that on top uh, of our background, along with our other projections, as you can see here. And we'll just go back to uh, the main footage. And there you have it. So again, we can kind of look at a before and after here. So one and two. And frame it up. So. And again, it's not perfect. Uh, I think this geometry is a little bit off-centered, uh, but this is just ways that, you know, it's not the greatest clone job, as you can see here. It kind of shows repeating features, which is what you never want to do. Um, and again, UVs may look a little bit stretched here, so that's why it looks kind of like either the, the resolution's a little bit too low or the UVs are a little bit too stretched. You can only, you really want to do this sort of thing on areas where they're, it's facing camera perpendicular direction of the camera moving that stuff that's like sort of parallel to the camera's direction because you can get artifacts and again this is all just for you guys to kind of take a look at and just you know enjoy and I think I'll just show you the general flaws with the final render here so you can see that this is not perfect and it's for us to explain why it's not perfect because of A, B, and C so that you can you know troubleshoot them later there's nothing wrong with showing a comp that actually has mistakes all right, so there you have it. Uh, you can see that the cloned area is slightly stretchy and wacky. And again, this probably could have been solved with some kind of planar system too. Um, you know, you could track the rock, which has no water over it, and then maybe clone over, you know, a piece next to it. You know, there's many easy ways. The parallax isn't correct back here too. If you look really closely, you can see the grass start to pull itself off of the ground. So the interpolation of our mesh wasn't the greatest back there. And again, this is something so far away, and as things go further away, they become less of a headache because they have less parallax, and hence you can do a quick planar over there, or a projection, or whatever. You know, if you move the mesh or use a model builder node and build some mesh back there. So there's many different ways to skin this can. I'm just showing you different things you can do inside of Nuke. I hope you enjoyed this, and again, hopefully we'll have more boring training coming.